Hello, everyone. Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 461. Today's episode is titled, Everyone Has the Right to Feel Safe. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, your host on the show, founder of Whistlekick, and a guy who loves martial arts. I love traditional martial arts. So that's why we do what we do. And you can see everything we do at whistlekick.com. One of the things you'll find over there is our store where you can buy stuff. And if you do buy stuff, use the code PODCAST15. That gets you 15% off every single thing we have there, from uniforms to equipment to shirts to hats. It's a bunch of stuff. We're adding more all the time. Go check it out if you haven't recently. Our digital home for this show, however, is a different website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. That's where you can find every single episode we've ever done, all for free. We bring you two a week. And the goal of the show is to connect, to educate, to inspire the global martial arts community. And if you want to support that effort, you can go to patreon.com slash whistlekick and make a monthly contribution. And if you're contributing at least $5 a month, we're bringing you even more stuff. More audio, more video, more, more, more. And of course, we have links to that support system from both whistlekick.com and whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. The inspiration for today's show came from a Facebook post that someone shared. And I don't know how many times it was shared before it made it to me. Last I looked, it was shared 145,000 times. But there was some great conversation that popped up in the comments on the share that I saw. And I wanted to respond to it because there were two very distinct opinions on how this should go. So first, because it's not too long, I'm going to read this post. Now, some of you may have seen this pop up on Facebook. And if you've already seen it, you can, you know, skip forward a minute or two. But if not, I want you to listen to this because without hearing this, you're not really going to understand what's going on. I don't usually read things on the show, but this is kind of important. This was shared originally on Facebook uh, 10 days ago, and the post is set to public, so we're going to have a link to that in the show notes, and it's from someone named Allison Davis. Five days of -of out-of-school suspension for beating up the kid that has been tormenting and bullying him since middle school, and uh, there's a a photo of a, a young man. I know as a parent, I'm supposed to be upset with him for resorting to violence or getting suspended, but I'm not, not even a little bit. For years, the school has failed Drew. When this kid has constantly threatened to beat Drew up, along with several of his friends, the school did nothing. When this kid followed Drew down the hall, threatening him and making fun of him, and it was all captured on video, the school did nothing. When other kids told teachers and administrators that this kid was threatening Drew, the school did nothing. When this kid took to social media, voicemails, and texting threats, the school did nothing. When this kid threatened Drew over and over in every class they have together, the school did nothing. Not once has the school ever punished the kid that has threatened and bullied Drew over and over. In middle school, Drew was afraid to walk down the halls because a swarm of this kid and his minions would make fun of and threaten Drew. He quit talking to the adults about it because they never disciplined the bully, and it just made the situation worse. I sent the school a lengthy email at the beginning of the year begging them to do something because Drew refused to talk to adults at school about it and because he knew it would do him no good. Drew had four classes with this kid, and he would not leave Drew alone. Their solution and response was to have him and his bully sign a no-contact contract. Seriously? I'm pretty sure I rolled my eyes. And, like Drew, I gave up on trying to get the school to actually do something that would stop this kid from bullying Drew. So, when this kid threatened Drew while on the bus, and then moved on to making fun of his dad and then threatening Jackson, his 11-year-old brother, Drew decided that he would quit relying on the school and the adults who are supposed to protect him, and he would do something. Three punches and his bully screamed like a baby. His minion friend shut up, and this morning the bully wouldn't even look at him. Problem solved. End of me reading, okay? I don't know where this took place, uh, looking at the photo of the boy and then the the reference to an 11-year-old brother. He looks like he's 13 to 15. Hard to say exactly. And, you know, not some big kid doesn't look intimidating or scary or anything. Uh, This is a story that we've heard time and again. But I want to talk about what's interesting to me about this post. So a friend of mine who trains martial arts uh, shared this on Facebook. And what you saw was the majority of people saying, yeah, it, it sounds like he didn't have a choice. It sounds like he was 
pushed to the edge, and he responded appropriately. But there was one person who was very firm in their belief that violence is never the action. It's never an appropriate response. And I spent some time contemplating it. And what, was, what I really appreciated about this conversation, this back and forth, was that no one was disrespectful, no one was accusatory. There was a genuine attempt on both sides of the discussion to not just understand what other people were saying, but convey what the individuals posting were thinking. I spent some time, I, I contributed a few posts to the conversation. And it was really interesting to read. And I'm not going to read my comment or the comments from others because I, I don't want anyone to, uh, to track it down. And I don't want anyone to you know, necessarily find the people who disagreed with me because that's not the point. And I found this really interesting because this was very similar to some stuff that I had endured as a child. Uh, it was not this bad because I never let it get this bad. I was lucky I, I never had to resort to this because I had the confidence of martial arts. I, I knew that if, if it came down to it, I could stand up for myself. But I was not confrontational. And it sounds like in this case, the reason that this young man stood up to his bully was because his brother was being brought into the conversation, into the mix. And when I think back to high school, there was one time that I stood up to someone and it was because they were aggressing on someone else. And I wasn't, I wasn't going to ha have that. It wasn't okay. It was a friend of mine. And I don't remember exactly what happened. I just remember walking up to him and saying, you know, you're done. This isn't happening. And it shocked him and he walked away. And he, to my knowledge, never messed with that kid again. And I think it's easier for those of us who endured bullying, who endured failures of authority figures in protecting us to understand these circumstances. Now, the people who disagree with the way this young man handled this, you know, I'm sure that they're not all from the exact same place in life. And I really hate generalizing, but I'm going to guess that the majority of people did not grow up being bullied, did not have to fear for physical harm time and again, day after day. And what this brought up for me, what I realized in reading it is, of course, the title of the episode, Everyone Has the Right to Feel Safe. And if you look at that across humanity, across species, this is a core instinct that we all feel. When will an animal attack when it feels threatened? The nicest animal in the world, if it's backed into a corner and feels threatened, will attack. The smallest animal will attack the largest animal if it feels it has no choice. And human beings, while we have the ability to think and rationalize, we still have that instinct. And we can choose to not act on it, of course. But that feeling of safety is our primary driver. And if you don't believe me, if you are hungry and being kicked in the shins, which one are you going to deal with first? <laughs> we have to remain safe in order to eat, to seek shelter, to procreate. All of the other instincts that we have as human beings, safety is first. And this is an example of what happens when that right to feeling safe is violated. Now, during this back and forth between myself and, and some mutual friends of this individual who shared the post, I came up with an analogy, and it was one that I feel pretty good about bringing into this conversation here, because I think it's the best correlation, the best analogy, there's a better word, for those of us that are adults who maybe haven't experienced this. And here it is. Imagine that you're sitting at home, you're watching television, and you see a stranger tapping on the windows. Maybe they make some threatening faces and maybe they, they hold their fist up in a, a violent or, or, again, threatening manner. Now, what do you do? The first thing you're going to do is, is you're going to have some kind of reaction. For some of us, we may go to the person, but let's say there are three or four people. Let's say 
you're there alone. Some of us who own firearms may, may choose to use that as a force equalizer, but let's imagine for the scenario's sake that you don't own firearms. You're there with your family. There are three or four of you, a couple of young children in the mix, and there are three or four larger people outside. What are you going to do? You're going to probably call the police. You're probably going to hide. Uh, maybe you grab a knife from the kitchen. You know, you're going to be fearful. And then let's imagine that the police say, well, they haven't done anything. So we, we can't come out. You're going to be frustrated. And then, you know, the people go away. But a couple days later, they come back. And they continue to threaten. They continue to make you feel scared in your own home. Fearful. Unsafe. And you call the police again. And they say, well, they haven't done anything. And maybe this continues. And every time they show up, they continue to menace you and your family. And the police do nothing. Or maybe they come out and say, hey, move along. They don't arrest them. There are no charges. Eventually, you're going to do something. The equivalent to what a lot of people would ask a child to do in, in the other situation, in the youthful situation that happens in school, the adult version is, well, you should move. Or you should ignore them. Draw the blinds. That doesn't make sense, does it? What are most people going to do? They're going to react. At some point, they're going to react because you deserve to feel safe in your own home. And when we look at these scenarios that happen daily in, I'm going to suspect, every single school, how do you resolve it? The instinct to bully and the instinct to feel safe are innate in humanity. And the only way you temper the instinct to bully is by leveraging social pressure and ultimately, if that's not enough, the use of force. There has to be some kind of corrective action to teach that bullying is not appropriate. Where does that instinct for bullying come from? It's social structure. Human beings are social in nature, and that bullying is an instinct that helps to sort out hierarchy. But just because that is instinct does not mean that we ignore it. In fact, we do the exact opposite. We find ways to support the opposite and balancing instinct of defense. And this is what a lot of school administrators don't understand, is that these two instincts are natural and they balance things out. I'm 40. And it, while it didn't happen often when I was a child, there were fights. But when I talk to people who are 20, 30 years older, it sounds like there were quite a few more fights. And bullying wasn't as big of a deal. It would happen. But if the bully was wrong, a group of kids would generally get together and kick their butt. Again, I don't know how, much, how often that happened. But it would make sense, right? It fits with my understanding of this social structure. And so what this child in this post that I read has done is followed all the rules. But he eventually succumbed to his instinct of self-preservation, his need to feel safe. I'm guessing I'm preaching to the choir here. I suspect that there are very few, if any, people listening to this episode who are going to say, Jeremy, you're wrong. There's never a time for violence. So there's selection bias in who I'm talking to. So why am I doing this? I'm sharing this because I want everyone to understand why we have problems with bullies. And it's because we have removed the balancing instinct from the equation. Now, I'll confess, it wasn't until I read this post that I fully understood this. I knew that there was something wrong. And I think we all understand there's something wrong that when someone bullies and the response is sign a no contact contract or just ignore him and walk away, we know that's not right. But I don't think most of us can articulate why. And I feel this is why. So I'm sharing information that is new to me. Now, some of you out there might have, and hopefully have, much more understanding of this subject. And if so, I want to hear from you. Maybe we can have you on the show. Maybe we can talk about this more. Because the psychology and the sociology of this 
are very important. And the more people who understand this, the better we can implement policies that punish bullies in an appropriate way so people can feel safe. If we're going to force children to go to school, they deserve to feel safe there. And anyone who is unwilling to protect that right has no business making decisions that affect children. Safety is more important than education. Safety is more important than anything. Those of you who teach martial arts, it's safety first. As I look through the comments on the original post, there are an overwhelming, I would say 90% supportive comments. Why? Because we get it. Because it's instinct. And it's time that we showed public schools that this is not how the world works. If you have the opportunity to have an impact on this subject, I hope that you will. Again, I want to hear from you. If you have commentary, if you have insight, if you're an expert in this field or know someone who is, I want to have them on the show. I want to talk about this. Because one of the things that martial arts and martial artists claim is that we can have an impact on this epidemic of bullying. So let's utilize some of the resources that we have here at Whistlekick to affect that impact. I want to thank you for listening. And if you want to comment, the best place is at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. And there are a number of ways you can help us out from supporting us via Patreon and getting some cool stuff for it. We're adding new things. There's, there's a lot coming. You can make a purchase at whistlekick.com. Use the code podcast15. You can share this episode or another episode or leave us a review anywhere that seems appropriate. Facebook or the Apple Podcast, Spot, Google. Now, if you have a suggestion for a guest related to this topic or another topic or maybe a Monday show, there's a guest form at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com or you can email us. Our social media, we are at whistlekick everywhere you can imagine. And I thank you for tuning in. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 